I'll just let these few people sit down and then we'll start. Oh, they're still coming in. There's another two looking for seats. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this afternoon's plenary session. This one's going to be split into two. So we'll have two speakers with me chairing and then we'll have Roni chairing for the lightning talks. So I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker this afternoon, who's John Holgate. And if you've been to previous network shops, you'll know he's given a number of talks as a parallel sessions, which have been highly entertaining. John is head no of the <laughs> network division at Cambridge University, which provides network and telecommunication services across the whole Cambridge state. And that spans the whole of the city. He's going to talk today about building his own fibre network. So, John. Thank you. Um, so this isn't my first talk. If I look familiar to some people around here, I've always wanted to do this. Um, <laughs> I'll have the photo later. Right, okay, so I'm going to talk about... Um, I certainly didn't build the fibre optic network. I'm going to talk about 25 years of Cambridge University owning a fibre optic network. Uh, and, and what we're expanding with it. So it's come up to the silver anniversary. Uh, 25 years as you get a little bit older, which is pertinent because it's my birthday today. Um, thank you very much. Uh, 25 years doesn't seem as it kind of time flies, and you forget how long 25 years ago is. So to remind you what it was like 25 years ago, uh, Clinton had just been elected president of America. Uh, a future host of The Apprentice Show uh, was making his name in business, which was not that one, the Alan Sugar one. And uh, to make you feel really old, Britain's most ever successful female Olympic athlete wasn't born yet. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, however, put it in context, uh, Cambridge University is over 800 years old, so maybe it's just a, a blip anyway. Right, so where does this start? Well, it actually starts before 92. Uh, the proposal to build a fiber optic network started in March 1987. So why am I giving this slightly anecdotal history? Why, why is this relevant? Because uh, there's a few odd things about it being March 1987. Uh, the web was created in 1991, which is peculiar because somebody planned building a fiber optic network before the web exists. Now, we're all smart networking people. We know that uh, the internet is more than the web, right? Well, here's another date for you. Here's the uh, request for comments, 1020, which a colleague of mine pulled out. And I think the format doesn't work because it hasn't been changed. There we go. It was November 1987, and this allocates the IP addresses for Cambridge University. So eight months after the plan to build a fiber optic network, we then get allocated some IP addresses, which is strange in itself. Um, you can see there that we get the 232nd Class B set of addresses, because all the Class B start at 128, and the R beforehand, for interest purposes, means it's a research group. So why are we doing this? Why would anybody build a fiber optic network prior to having an IP network? Uh, let's go back a bit further then. Let's go back to 1822. <laughs> Uh, Charles Babbage, um, this guy is really the father of computing. 1822, he wrote a grant application to the British government. He's a, a, a Cambridge University academic to design a, a difference engine. So this is a piece of equipment that will turn log tables and automatically convert them, something that used to be done by humans or a human computer, to give them their full title. Um, they awarded him £1,700 the following year, in 1823, and like good or all good academics, he worked in it for a bit until he got bored and gave up, and then started his next project, which was the analytic engine, which was some 20 years later. Um, two interesting things to note. One, 
The British government, after he failed to deliver a difference engine, started buying them from the Germans in the 1850s. And two, the first programmer of the analytic engine was Ada Lovelace, who was a woman. So there you go, first, first, female, first programmer was a woman. Uh, skip forward, 1930s. Morris Wilkes at the university, he's a maths guy, decides that he wants to build an electronic computer with this guy, which you'll all find familiar, because that's Alan Turing. They set up the computer lab. Uh, war happens, some unpleasantness after the war. Uh, Ed Sack has built the first electronically programmable computer. Uh, subsequently, Cambridge publishes the first programming manual, designs Kerberos authentication, and then later on in the 70s, Acorn Computing came out of Cambridge University, as did ARM processing chips, as did Raspberry Pis. The point being, it's a research university. It builds stuff for research. So in 1977, the first network was built, the Ethernet Cambridge Digital Communication Ring, which had a speed of 10 megabits a second, which is actually pretty good in 1977. It took 36 years for me to get a better connection at my house. <laughs> Third of a century is not bad. OK, so the, uh, the information I got from the request paper or the submission paper is to build an optical fiber cable cabling across university and colleges and combining mainframe with other computers and personal machines. So we've got EDSAC, we've got these mainframe computers that are developed centrally. This is about connecting your local workstation. Principally, it was uh, about connecting classics. The classics thought it would be a really useful way of sharing books. Uh, the scientists weren't interested at the time, apparently, but times change. Uh, why Granta? So any of you have seen this awful, sickly TV show that's set in a village outside of Cambridge. Uh, same stem of the word. Granta is a tributary river to the river camp. So it's just a, named after a river. Uh, building a network. So the network, once approved, and that's deliberately blurry, uh, I'll explain that later, takes four years, from 1988 to 1992. And it's installed in principally in three locations. Uh, before we get on to that, cost. £3.9 million in 1992. If you want the modern money for that, double it. Roughly, it's doubled since 92. So it's a pretty expensive research project. It installed 36 kilometers of ducting. So this is plastic tubing under the roads and tray work. And it was installed in wine cellars, 2.2 kilometers of the stuff, green spaces, and carriageways. Right, so, so let's, let's dissect those three areas. Wine cellars. And bearing in mind, it's still running through these places. There you go, there's a wine cellar. Uh, there's the cabling. Hasn't come out quite right, but you get the idea. A um, Couple of problems with laying cables in wine cellars. First of all, normally, if you want to pull a fiber optic cable, you open a manhole, you get a big van with a reel on the back, and you pull 100 meters of fiber down the street, and you can pull fiber pretty quickly. In a wine cellar, you have to do it by hand. So this is manually somebody going around a tray work and attaching a new bit of fiber optic every time you want to put in more capacity. This is not a very efficient way of working. The other problem is, is it's a wine cellar. Uh, so, so not all of the colleges in Cambridge have wine cellars, but some do. Uh, it's reputed that one of them has 160,000 bottles of wine in there. Um, or it should have 160,000 bottles of wine. There's a, there's a possibility that there might not be quite as much wine in there as there should be, and that delta is accounted for by a lovely Cambridge term, which is called wine leakage, <laughs> which covers why there's less wine than there should be. So colleges have become sensitive to wine leakage as an issue, and now they don't just let anybody down there. You now have to be accompanied by a porter or security guard who stays with you the whole time, which makes this costly, painful, timely. It's not a good place to run fiber optic networks. Uh, green spaces and soft dig. Soft dig literally just means in the ground, whereas tarmac is a hard dig, soft dig is soft. So Cambridge is a historic core. Um, there you go, these are two shots in the center of town. To give you an idea of why you'd put it in soft dig, to dig turf, 
the market rate for digging turf is about 20 pounds a linear meter to put your ducting down. To put it in footway, pathway, that's about 40 pounds a linear meter. Carriageway in the road, that's 80 pounds a linear meter. The difference between that and footway is you need a lot of traffic management. If you want to pull up cobbles, of which there's quite a lot in Cambridge, that's 120 pounds a linear meter. That gets expensive. So there's obviously an aversion to doing that. So we put it in, in green spaces. The trouble is green spaces, and there's a lot of them in Cambridge, is that people tend to build on top of green spaces, which is unfortunate because that's exactly where you put your fibre optic network. This is northwest Cambridge. We've had to move our fibre optic cable on several occasions. That's west Cambridge. And they come up with design plans, so you think you're moving the fibre to somewhere that won't be built on. And then, like all good universities, the design plans move, and then you find out they're also going to build on where you've just moved the fibre to. Even in city centres, uh, this is a new museum site, the, uh, uh, the fibre optic cables get dug up because they pull down buildings and they redevelop it. So soft dig and courtyards aren't a very reliable. Roads are far more reliable places because they tend not to move or be built on very often. Other problem with soft dig is it's soft and... Uh, well, with the roads, people tend to check before they dig the roads. They tend to check what's down there. They don't do that so much in soft dig. They just put up fence posts uh, with fence post borers. There's a, uh, a fibre optic cable. If the network goes down, invariably you'll find a smoking fence post borer that's kind of like a dam buster's raid gone across a field and managed to hit your fibre. Uh, that's another one going down. That's me holding a piece of fibre. If you're not technically minded, uh, this piece is broken <laughs> at both ends. bit in the middle is fine. I don't know why I took that photo. Intrig intriguing me at the time. Uh, where are you going? So, so soft dig is fun. Ah, oh, the other thing about soft dig. Uh, so in some places, it runs through fields, farmer's fields. Now, farmer's fields, you, uh, you can't put a manhole. You, you've got to put a manhole every 100 metres because you get too much friction dragging fibre optic cable. So... You can't do that in the field, that's okay. You wait till it's out of season, and then you go into the field when it's just a muddy pit, dig it up, break your duct open, pull your fibre, seal the duct, give it back to the farmer. Unless you're in a real hurry to deploy fibre, which was the first three months of my, my post, in which case you've then got to negotiate buying peas off a farmer. <laughs> uh, Precisely £1,000 worth of piece, which is not a way I thought my career was going to develop when I joined <laughs> Networks. Um, I also naively expected £1,000 of peas to turn up at my office in a kind of slightly excited way. But the point is, they hadn't been harvested, so they weren't grown. So I didn't even get the peas. Uh, right, moving on to roads. Uh, there's standards on roads. It's the National Joint Utilities Group does standards. Tells you where to put your gas, your electricity, your sewerage. This is an example diagram off their website of the footway. So you can see uh, lamp post top left, there you go, and it tells you how far down to put it. Now before people dig up the roads, they should, and they tend to, check what's down there first. Uh, a lot of stuff, electricity, sewerage, water, that all shows up on effectively a metal detector and plans. Uh, telecoms fiber doesn't have metal in it. So it won't show up, but that's okay. The standards are very clear. Uh, telecoms, there you go. Put it at 350 mil. Now, for whatever reason, and I can only imagine they were gold plating it, Cambridge University thought, we can go better than 350 mil. <laughs> we'll put it down here at 600 mil, which seems like a good thing, right? Except for the person who comes along next to dig up the pavement goes down to 350 mil ever so carefully because they're worried they're going to come across fibre optics. They don't. They carry on down to about 450 mil, at which point they're pretty sure nobody's put anything any deeper than that. And then they go straight through your fibre. Uh, not only did we do that in the footway, so that's what should be in footway and carriageway, we repeated the mistake in the carriageway. There you go. So it's all gone in at the wrong depth. So what do we use it for? Uh, we use it for all the stuff you use it for, right? We use it for internet local area networks, wireless, high-performance computing, uh, LoRa network, we just deployed a LoRa network using the fiber, so all the kind of standard fibery stuff, uh, the day-to-day -day commodity stuff. 
Mm. What else? Uh, BMS, data center hosting, public Wi-Fi. Nice thing about fiber is you don't get the attenuation you do on copper. So if you want to put access points that are more than 90 meters, 100 meters from a cabinet, you can run fiber as long as you like. Just put a media converter on the end. You can stick a public access Wi-Fi anywhere you like or anywhere near your fiber network. College hostels. Colleges buy a lot of houses. They turn them into accommodation. Uh, they typically rent BT and Virgin circuits for a couple of thousand pounds a year. Turns out it's cheaper over a five, typically five, six year period for us to dig up the road and lease some fiber than to get a poor service off BT or, or Virgin Media. Uh, CCTV, there you go. So who do we sell to? Which is an odd thing for universities to talk about. So Cambridge is federated. Uh, and we obviously provide this to ourselves. We consume our own fiber optic service. And we also sell it, so we get an income from 31 colleges. Uh, there's also medical research councils, Anglia Ruskin University, rent our fiber, Cancer Research UK, museums, councils, Bass, Hills Road, Long Road, anybody we can. So we lease this dark fiber. It's in the ground. You've paid the expensive bit is paying to get it in the ground or the ducting. Leasing fiber is cheap. So what's the cost? Well, I say cheap. Uh, there you go. It's half a million a year, because that's how much money we generate from our fiber optic network each year. And that pays for 850 active circuits. So roughly, that's 260 pounds a kilometer. That's how much it costs to run your own fiber network on an OPEX basis. Uh, we also pay for staff out of that, equipment, maintenance, extensions, office overheads, and promotion, which is an odd thing to do, promoting uh, our service. Um, it's just fiber. Well, you want to sell it, right? You want to tell people you've done all this investment, you've put it in the ground, you want people to procure it, rent it, use it, if it's a good service, and you want to get an income from it. The trouble is, you can't tell people where it is. Because unfortunately, uh, undesirables tend to try to steal the copper out of the fiber network which is not an outcome that works out very well for anybody in that scenario. Uh, so you want to show people where the network goes without showing them where it goes. So this was a, this was a problem. And then uh, a few years ago, on a trip to London, I saw this. And I thought, well, this is, this is obvious. This tells me exactly where the network goes without actually telling me where it goes. So we thought, how hard can that be? We'll have a go. Um, turns out it's quite hard. That's <laughs> uh, Neither of us are very good artists. Um, we used a computer because we thought that would be better than our artistic skills, and it wasn't. And then we went and got an, uh, somebody who knew what they were doing involved, and we got this, which is quite good. Uh, we use it for promotion. It's taken off very well. We uh, print cases for iPhones and all that sort of stuff. We send out mugs. Uh, this one is our 25th year anniversary of it. So there we go. We've done a nice silver. That's not worked at all, but anyway, you get the idea. All right, so that's how we promote it. So we run a large fiber optic network. And last year, the European Commission was asking for submissions and approached us about submissions to do with the Gigabit Society. So this is about delivering high-speed internet connection services to both commercial or public sector and residential. So we run a reasonably large private fiber network. They invited us along. And we submitted some information, and we told them we thought that fiber's probably a good thing, and we think it's the future, um, and has been for 25 years. Um, and the paper came out in September. You can read the paper. It tells you that if by 2025, the rest of Europe is going to aim for a minimum of 100 meg per, per household, and a gigabit, ideally a gigabit for everybody. Uh, I was asked in the Q&A session about GFAST. Why bother with fiber? Why not just use GFAST? Now, I don't know whether you're all familiar with GFAST. This is a collaboration between um, national network providers. So in this country, it's BT, and then every country has their equivalent. And GFAST is a way of using vectoring or different frequencies to get more speed out of the tail. In other words, this is a way of sweating their existing copper asset their tail asset, so they don't have to dig up the road and lay more fiber. That sounds like a potentially contentious position. 
Uh, but that is the position on their own website. They say specifically, this is about less fiber digging. Now, we think this is mad. We, we think the future has to be fiber. It's, it's the direction it's going to go, because capacity is going to always increase. Vectoring gives you additional speed over GFAST. And it's good. At the top, it gives you 750 megabits a second using your copper tail. So this is from the green cabinet in the street to your home, traditionally. So you definitely get a, a performance improvement. But look at the distance. It's 50 to 100 meters. Over 50 meters, the advantage of vectoring starts falling off a cliff edge. By the time you get over here, if this works, to 300 meters, you get no advantage. Unless your house happens to be next to the cabinet, vectoring's not really going to do a lot for you. If you're in a rural community and you're two kilometers, it's going to do nothing for you. So generic internet, everybody, I've been to so many talks where people have tried to predict where internet consumption's going and then predict whether you're going to need copper or fiber. Look, as long as we presume time is linear and it's going to carry on moving, and the data is going to go up, it doesn't matter how you draw that graph. Sooner or later, copper's not going to cut it anymore, and fiber is. So our contention, and I think it's been shown at Cambridge University, is the sooner you make that investment and put the fiber in the ground, the quicker you get the return on investment. So you can get loads of graphs. And people have tried to model what internet consumption looks like. It really doesn't make any difference. We think fiber is the only solution. It's the only thing that's going to act for the capacity and the speed. <laughs> Actually, interesting, interesting anecdote. Uh, relationship manager, so we're, we're, we're extending, improving our network capacity to a location, a, a hospital location at, in Cambridge. And we have relationship managers. And one of them contacted me and said, uh, when are we going to get the new network connection down to the hospital? And I said, well, We've already got a network connection. We've already got fiber there. They went, yeah, but when are you going to get the faster one in? And I said, well, it is, it is the speed of light at the moment. Now, I, I think I knew what they were asking, but it really was the wrong question. Uh, here we go. How do we compare to everybody else? Uh, South Korea and Japan, almost 100% fiber to the premises. There we go. UK, as of the end of 2015, 4%, 3%, 4%. Spain, look, Spain, they're a basket case. They're on 60%. How are we at 4%? Unbelievable. Right, big data. So uh, I've seen a few people talk about this. This is amazing, right? This is the Large Hadron Collider. I'm not a particle physicist. Don't really understand it. It's amazing. It's the world's largest science experiment, and people have come from around the world to collaborate this, and everybody involved. And it generates really big data generate 25 petabytes of data a year. That's a lot of data. The next big experiment, the next one that's coming along, is this one, which is the square kilometer array. Right? This is going to open in 2020. Uh, it's going to be lots of those don't exist anymore, which is why the dodgy picture off Wikipedia. It's going to be um, South Africa, Australia, Chile, a lot of satellite dishes, see to the edge of the universe, that kind of stuff. One on the left generates 25 petabytes a year. This generates an exabyte, which is 40 times, a day. A day. Yeah, well, quite. Um, to give you an idea, because it's difficult to perceive quite how much data that is, we have a 40 gig internet connection. If we were to download a day's worth of data and nothing else, nonstop, from the square kilometer array, it's going to take six years and nine months uh, with a 40 gig internet connection. It's a staggering amount of data. And the only way we're going to start shifting this is more fiber. It's just going to be more fiber. Uh, so people say, well, that's OK for, that's okay for universities. You're research-based. doesn't really apply to the wider society. OK, 2003, the human genome was decoded at a cost of $3 billion. You can now get, and that took 13 years, I think. I think it started in 1990s, 13 years. Uh, you can now buy Illumina, now do gene sequences that take eight hours and generate a terabyte of data. Um, 
For, my, for, for Christmas this year, my parents bought me an ethnicity testing kit. Now, I thought this was an interesting way of telling me I've been adopted. <laughs> um, but apparently not. Uh, this goes through some identifiers, markers, about a million pairs, and tells you a little bit about where your, your family history is from. Uh, 75 pounds to buy that. So that was three billion pounds to do the first human genome. 13 years later, it's 75 pounds to do a DNA profile of me. That's amazing. That has commoditized so quickly, and that's only going to drop. Um, so other than me spitting in a tube and sending it off, which is how this works, right? Because we're still stuffing stuff in the Royal Mail and whatever delay that's adding. Well, AstraZeneca are moving to Cambridge. They're building a 400 million pound head of research area. And they are banking on gene sequencing being for the next array of drugs, a, a range of drugs. So the drug pipeline, as you've probably read, is running out. Uh, new drugs are expensive to de develop. Turns out a lot of good drugs have actually been developed in the last 40 years, but have never made it to the market. Because unfortunately, whenever you do the drug testing, that one in 25 people dies or some unpleasant side effect that means you don't get it approved. Well, the latest thinking is actually it's people with certain genetic markers uh, can't have a certain drug. But if you could identify who those are, you've already got an existing large range of drugs you can ship to the wider market that's been through most of the testing. Uh, that means these things are going to start turning up all over the place, and we're all going to have to get genetically tested in the not-so-distant future. And by all over the place, I mean Sainsbury's. I mean, these are going to be, these are going to be commoditized real quick. Uh, that's the new building they're building. We are going to make sure we're going to share data with them, very large amounts, so we're definitely putting our own fiber optic network into their building, because we want to have collaborative research with them. Right. What lessons have we learned about running our own fiber optic network and expanding it? Because it was originally 36 kilometers, we're up to about 60 kilometers of ducting now. Standards. It's all about standards. Standards, standards, standards. Um, they've all been written. They're all perfectly acceptable. None of us are smarter than the standards. Uh, don't gold plate it. Don't value engineer it. Just follow them. They're all written. Uh, data demand is growing. Look, we all see this. We intuitively know it's true. Data's going up. Sooner or later, we're going to need more fiber. So it's cheaper to get it in the ground now. Uh, we know fiber's the solution. We know it's definitely not copper, because copper has all sorts of issues with attenuation and cost and people stealing it and all the other bad things that is uh, uh, affected by copper. It's really cheap. It's really cheap. Building your own fiber optic network is really cheap. Uh, we have 850 circuits, and that costs us half a million pounds a year to run. If we were to go to the open market for 850 10 gig circuits, let's say we were getting them at 10,000 pounds each, eight and a half million pounds a year OPEX to reproduce what we're getting. Even if we're paying half that, it's four and a half million pounds. This pays for itself in a few years. All of our extensions pay for themselves within five or six years. So it's not expensive. It's really easy. It sounds complicated, it's not. It's really easy to, to lay down your own fiber. Uh, I can prove that, because uh, these guys can do it. Uh, and this is, I mean, honestly, it's, it's like a poor man's right said Fred. It's, <laughs> I mean, if, if we can figure out how to run our own fiber optic network, it shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, there are, I don't know whether you've ever had them talk, but Barn, have you come across Barn? So they are a community based up in Lancashire, I think, that have terrible connectivity, they do it themselves. It's a community of people. They get a tractor with a spike on the back. They run blown fiber through the fields. They get themselves really good internet connection, and they're doing it themselves. So it's not difficult. Right, final lesson. We shouldn't be doing this <coughs> at all. This is crazy. Now, I know again a few blank spaces, but you weren't paying attention at the beginning, right? It was built as a research product. It was for researching. It's not commodity. The moment stuff gets commoditized, universities stop doing it, and we get the private sector to do it. Because they should be able to do it cheaper and more reliable and more efficiently than me. They're just not. The market has fundamentally failed in fiber. Uh, you would think I was crackers if Cambridge University was still building its own computers rather than buying them from Dell. 
right? It should be cheaper to get a private sector to do this. Um, we know BT OpenReach is splitting with BT. We don't know how long that's going to take. Um, even after that, so I think that was announced in November. In December, DMCS, or DCMS, Department for Culture, Media and Sport, did a call for evidence. And that was about getting local fibre providers to open up their networks. They're basically acknowledging, in their call for evidence, that there is no competition out there for fibre. It's, it's a completely sterile market. And that unless you're providing it yourself, there's nobody for doing it. So unless uh, or until the commercial sector, we're doing it ourselves. That's it. Thank you very much, John. Have we got any questions, or can you ask any questions of that? I have one comment, actually, thinking about it. Barn, I think, has an involvement from people from Lancaster, will remember Barry Ford? I'm pretty sure he's involved in so. that. I think so, yeah. Any questions? No? It would be my pleasure. <laughs> Don't have a tie. It's a, honestly, it's a different suit. He's signing autographs later. I think yeah, I had a charging. shave last year. If anything, I think I look better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need the clicker. <laughs> Go on, there must be some more questions while we're messing around. There's one there and there's one right at the top. So, Paolo, could you pick up that one in the middle there? Yeah. And then... Nobody? Right, it's one over there. And then Hello. One in the middle. Uh, Richard Uver from Lancaster University. Um, Barry, who created Barn, is now delivering fibre for £30 a month. What I'd not realised is Barry's boss was Doug Shepherd yeah. for many years, and Doug Shepherd was the architect of your fibre, by the looks of it. I think so, so yes. It's a very small world. It is. And additionally, Barry is recruiting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, uh, you're right. I mean, the one thing is there's not a lot of people around the country who are good at designing fibre optic networks. But you don't have to because you can go to, we don't dig the roads ourselves. We subcontract them from suppliers who give us very good rates, same as commercial rates. They'll also design it and implement it for you as well if you want them to, if you don't have the expertise. So you don't need one of the few guys around the country who are good at this stuff. They'll do it for you. Okay. We've got a question there. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm just wondering what you use for um, being able to document what you've got patched. Do you, uh, do you do a lot of moves, ads, changes? And if so, uh, so, so how so do you keep on top of it? And that is an excellent question. Um, so I've been in this role for several years, and that image where I'm holding the fiber, uh, that was the first time I started to look in detail at our documentation, because um, when I came back, I was like, who's been disconnected? And they were, uh, they were accessing their record system on this to try to figure out, and it was literally notepad files, um, which circuits. So we're at the moment, we're in a project to implement a product called Intellify which is, um, it's an industry standard piece of software which does cable management. It's really good, we're happy to give you a demo. Uh, we think we'll have that completely implemented by the end of the year. But it's, it's a cable management system that every ISP uses. Any more questions? Otherwise I'm sure that uh, John will welcome birthday drinks in the bar later on. Indeed. Thank you very much, John. That was excellent. Our next speaker is from University Hospital Birmingham, and it's Paul Jennings, and he's going to speak about his experiences in rolling out new and supposedly automated supposedly. services. So oh, yeah. over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I hope you're enjoying the sessions. Um, lots of words up there, but uh, who exactly am I and what do they mean? Um, my name is Paul Jennings, and I'm the Head of Technical Operations Infrastructure at the University Hospital Birmingham. In short, I look after third-line support, data center, um, I suppose network infrastructure, and telecoms at the QE Hospital. 
I'm going to share with you how IT is managed at the QEHB, how IT is seen as an enabler and not as a tool, and the approach taken to developing services in a challenging healthcare environment. On the surface, healthcare may seem very different to education, but underneath, it is similar. Each of us balance the needs of the users for the benefits of either students or patients. Our users are not computer people, but they are there to help others. We all need to be alert to the challenging factors, such as security, malicious or inadvertent, and information governance, all in a rapidly changing world where our users, patients or students, have high expectations. So here are some of my stories about my day job, what I do, and what IT does within a large hospital. You may be able to relate to what I say, or you may think that this is totally different, or you may think that what I do is actually nothing to, compared to the challenges that you guys get up to. But what I would like to encourage is that there are some similarities, and we can learn from each other. Okay, so let me tell you about where I work. So, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Birmingham was opened in 2010. It was built alongside the existing Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which was intended to be mothballed. It cost £554 million to build and is a PFI deal. It has 1,213 inpatient beds, um, it has 32 operating theatres and a 100-bed critical care unit, making it the largest critical care unit in the world. It is a regional centre for cancer care and has the largest solid organ transplantation program in Europe. Since 2001, the QE has been the home of the Royal Centre for the Defence Medicine, which is the primary receiving unit for all military patients that are injured overseas. Unfortunately, it was very busy during the Iraq conflicts. The QE sees a million patients a year, has 10,000 members of staff, and is the largest single campus healthcare facility in Europe. As far as IT goes, there are over 800 miles of copper cabling, 600 switches, so it's copper cabling, sorry John, it's not fiber, <laughs> 90 hub rooms, 21,500 network ports, and over 500 access, wireless access points. It would not be hard to guess, but a hospital is a 24 hour business, meaning we don't have downtime, just slightly less inconvenient. So the go live of the QE from the old hospital was nothing short of a military operation. Everything was switched over in a matter of hours from the old hospital to the new one. Patients had to be transferred by trolley across a bridge, which you, can, you might be able to see in one of the images at the top left there. Um, Theatre staff had to stop in one hospital, restart in another one. Ambulances had to go to a different emergency room. It, the whole thing took around about 36 hours non-stop. Computers and software all had to be up and running before it went. I was not part of the team, I've got to admit, when this happened, but what I have learned is that the trust takes working together very seriously. IT services report directly into the medical director, which puts our users at the heart of everything that we do. This does mean that we have the ability to engage with clinicians when designing services, and each of our projects will have clinician input. IT services are ISO 27001 and ISO 9001 accredited, and our structure is based around ITIL best practice. We have a number of other decision-making bodies. The EPR exec, this is the executive board of the electronic patient records, which is at the heart of the hospital, and I'll tell a little bit more about that later. This is where all our patient information is stored, and any decision regarding the development needs to be signed off by this group. The second group is CAG, the Chief Executive's Advisory Group. Chaired by the Trust's Chief Executive, any business case for investments needs to be presented for approval and is scrutinized by all directors across the Trust. The cultural approach to IT within UHB does not restrict development, but ensures that the work we do is useful and will meet clini clinical objectives. Through the PFI agreement, Support for the ICT network was outsourced. This covers telephony, local area network, wide area network, Wi-Fi, along with a few other services. Through this, our network partner was required to ensure that UHB had an infrastructure that met the challenging and evolving needs of an innovative hospital. 
which was not easy as it may appear. While we do have a nice shiny hospital, pictures are gone, but we have a number of retained estate buildings, mainly the old hospital or some of the support buildings. Our partner needs to ensure that the quality of service was acceptable across the whole of the estate, but also over time ensure that that was brought up to a greater standard. I must admit, had I been around at the time, I probably would have been asking, do we really want someone to come in and tell us how we do it? Can't we do it ourselves? But from the outcome and the situation that we found ourselves in, I'm very glad that it is there and it is a great network. It is one less thing for me to worry about. The quality of the network is there, and should anything go wrong, I have people on call to be able to help out and get it solved. I also feel that should we move away from the existing arrangement, then we'll be passing on a solid and developed network infrastructure to whoever or whatever comes along in the future. At QEHB, we in IT see ourselves as a partner to the business and not just a fixer of problems. We believe that IT is a fundamental part of the organization, and we all understand that it is a partnership between the IT and the organization. Without this partnership, IT does not release the potential from both technology and the staff. It is through this cultural approach uh, that we have successfully delivered innovation and received acknowledgement for the efforts that we've put in. We consider ourselves adding value to the organization. The approach that we take may not resemble a traditional public sector organization, but it actually works for us. Whilst we pride ourselves of being that partner of the business, we also know that needs change and evolve. Not only do new technologies develop, but as governance and procedures requirements change, often these changes are outside of the control of IT, so we have to adapt. Within IT, we regularly review our structure to ensure that we are meeting the organizational needs. This enables us to be more responsive and align our resources to the right area when needed. Whilst we are flexible, we have also developed a good foundation to, uh, based on quality standards, such as the ISO 27001 and 9000, which allow us to check that our flexibility will not actually break us. I like to think of IT services as a reed in a river. It's flexible enough to move when things change, when the current flows or the wind blows, but it has solid roots and solid foundations to be able to stay where it is no matter what is thrown at it. One of the underlying foundations for IT services at the QE is the CAG. All changes followed a detailed change advisory process. Held every Wednesday morning, and yes, I was there this morning, change requesters have to submit any requests via quite a detailed change form at least a week before. This lead time allows for the change lead to review the submission and recommend any amendments. It is then distributed to a number of teams for approval, so it goes to testing to ensure that any, uh, the appropriate level of testing has taken place. Support to make sure that once the change is in, that there will be no unforeseen support issues. The program to ensure that if the project was part of a wider program, it has met its objectives. Technical design to make sure it doesn't fall foul of any existing infrastructure. Information governance to make sure that appropriate privacy impact assessments have taken place. And the network to ensure that, again, the change will not have any detrimental impact on it. Finally, the submission is presented to the CAG board, which is made up of non-IT members with clinical, operational, and IG responsibilities. The change requester is required to reassure the trust via the CAG that the change will not have a lasting impact on the services provided and provide confidence that the change will be managed in a suitable way. The areas the CAG meeting does seem to focus on is testing, benefits realization, which may or may not be appropriate for the CAG, and the go-live rollback comms plan. We also have a small change log, which records any changes that, with minimal impact that are not deemed necessary to go to a full CAG. I see the CAG as the final say as to whether or not the trust will accept the risk that the change may cause, 
Hence the requirement that the requester needs to reassure the group. Over the last few years, the CAG has been an evolution. Previously, it was seen as a last minute sort of thing and project managers were hurling kind of change requests in and they were getting rejected. Today, project managers and requesters are engaging different parts of the organization a lot sooner. And that's delivering less rejections and delivering more successful changes. So I'm just going to come on to some of the solutions that we've actually delivered. So as the student record to you is the master information source in education, so the patient record is to me in healthcare. I'm glad to say that within UHB at least, brown folders full of patient notes being wheeled around on trolleys are rapidly reducing and have been for some time. I would like to say that we are paperless, but we're not. That would be lying. We're more paper appropriate. Whilst there are areas that still use paper, everything is scanned in to the electronic patient record. To meet the needs of the trust, IT have developed in-house a number of products that make up the electronic patient record. The first is our GP practice page. This is a tool developed by UHB which allows our GPs to see the hospital records of their patients. Just going to let you into a little secret, you might realise this, but just because we all work for the NHS does not automatically mean we have access to all NHS data. <laughs> GPs have a pile, we have a pile, community have a pile. Access to medical histories, previous medications, or even end of life wishes are often a problem for a hospital such as UHB, which can receive referrals from a wide geographic area. Within Birmingham region, we are working with across the health economy to promote legitimate data sharing for the benefit of patients. The GP practice page is one such example. It allows the GPs to see admissions, read results, check correspondence, and it is in use with over 400 practices across the region on a daily basis. The second part of the patient record is the clinical portal. Again internally developed, the portal is the gateway to viewing the whole picture. Medical staff have the ability to see the full patient history, including shared information from the live GP records. The clinical portal is made up of two parts, a document repository and the live lookups. When letters are created, they are automatically uploaded into the repository and any documents received or paper notes created are scanned and added to the record. We also have a number of systems uh, which perform dedicated tasks such as imaging or medical results or lab results. The portal interrogates these systems using HL7 messaging and pulls back what data it can, presenting it in the portal or, if necessary, links out to the host system. Just a few kind of images of what we got. A quick glance at the portal. Um, so you've got, that's not going to work. So you've got a generic sort of lookup. You can see the demographic information. It's got an easy to read kind of sections on the specialities down the left hand side. Role based access ensures that only authorized people are entitled to view certain bits of information. And a simple layout means quick and easy navigation. This system has been around for a while, and so we are looking to revamp this. So a quick sneak peek, sneak peek of what's coming in the future. This is again has been developed in-house, but using feedback from staff overseen by the EPR executive board. It has been designed to give as much relevant information as quickly as possible based on patient information and also role-based access. It has already gained interest locally and from other trusts, and we're looking to roll this out on a commercial basis. So, in the same way that UHB provides patient information to GPs, we also provide online information to patients themselves through the My Health at QEHB. At home, we all work in an online way, logging into portals and systems to be able to see information for utilities, uh, mobile phones, even local government. 
So why should health be any different? I would imagine that you lot already have many of these sort of technologies in place, so consider this as our chance of trying to catch up to you. Try. This gives the patient the opportunity to review appointments, uh, review their medication and prescriptions, and any correspondence to update their record. As part of my health, results are available. Deciding to do this required much thinking around the ethics. It was finally agreed that certain results need to be approved by a clinician before a patient can see them. The fundamental question was, how would a patient feel if on discovering distressing news via a portal and possibly out of context? In the very early trial days of the project, this did actually happen, but luckily it turned out for the best. An appointment had already been made for the patient to see the clinician, and upon discovering the bad news, the patient dealt with this emotion in their own way, resulting them being mentally prepared to meet with the clinician and discuss their situation. Even though that this was a positive outcome, it was felt that discovering information from a computer is not really the best way for us. The next element of our electronic patient record is the Prescribing Information and Communication System, or PICS. In summary, this is a live record of a patient's stay in hospital. It records where they are at any time. It allows the clinicians to make requests for tests, for view results, or prescribed medicines and it is picked up and shared by the various departments in the hospital. This and Portal are the two key systems in use on a daily basis. At a glance, it is possible for a clinician to see the full history and current status of the patient. As part of our disaster recovery process, these are the systems that we'll be rushing to get back online as quickly as possible. As all of these have been developed in-house, it has allowed us to commercialize the software, and as such, a number of other trusts are actually interested in this. The final part of this is the Outpatient Tracking Information Management System, Optims. It is the logistical part of the electronic patient record. When an appointment is necessary, the patient is sent a barcoded letter and upon arrival at the hospital, a number of kiosks are available for the patient to check themselves in. This is particularly used for outpatient appointments such as follow-up clinics. When checked in, the system tells the patient where to wait and notifies the clinician that the patient is available. When the clinician is ready, using the portal system, they can call the patient to the appointment. Again, this is updated on the wait screens in the various rooms around the hospital. On completing the appointment, the clinician uses Portal to manage the follow-up actions, such as further appointments or tests, which are then effectively managed by Optums, closing that loop around. Again, this is another one of the systems that we've commercialized and actually be able to sell out. So now, where do we go into the future? And whilst these are some challenges for healthcare. You all recognize them. Cybersecurity has taken center stage in recent years, and quite a few health care providers have fallen victim of malware, phishing, or other threats. Just a slight aside, the last couple of days we've been managing a number of increased phishing attacks uh, coming through, which also affected our neighbors, the University of Birmingham, a couple of days ago. It's affecting us as well, and so it's, something seems to be doing the rounds at the moment. So watch out for Vodafone bills and DHL packages at the moment. So um, managing and responding to these threats is not an easy problem to solve. Firstly, there is the engagement. Luckily for us, this is not going to notice at UHB. So it helps that we have a senior information risk owner who is aware of the threats and encourages us to seek to resolve them not through not only technical, but also educational means. It is often said that when, when it comes to cybersecurity, the weakest link is a human. So by working with the information governance, we not only implement technical barriers, but also educational support for members of staff. This could be alerts on a regular basis, regular bulletins out to members of staff, 
Uh, it could be part of mandatory training. We do cyber awareness as part of mandatory training as well. The balance that we need to weigh up is how do we protect our network on one side, but without stifling that innovation that we all need on the other side. It would be all too easy to shut everything down to protect against a threat, but either nothing would happen, or, which is more often the case, an alternative way would be found to do something. I've not mentioned much about data protection, but this is one of the underlying principles of healthcare. A breach could lead to financial or reputational damage or the disclosure of sensitive patient information. It is not a subject taken lightly, especially that we at UHB often care for high-profile patients. So the GDPR will actually have a great impact on how we deliver electronic services, especially on a regional level. And we will need to ensure that, again, we balance our requirements for innovation with patient care and data protection. IoT and BYOD will be challenges for me in the future. I have to ensure that whatever comes onto the network is secure and not going to compromise patient safety. There are already examples of um, medical devices being shipped with quite easy to break passwords, which is a bit concerning, or certain elements turned on. So that we're trying to engage with suppliers to ensure that when medical devices come onto us, there are security profiles in place already. But it is always a balance between this innovation and safety. Already we have examples of staff working around the system using other apps and other software to be able to solve problems that we as IT haven't actually addressed. A few quick future projects. We're currently writing the business case for an active, active secondary data center. I was quite interested to pick up the stuff earlier about the data center, I'll be bearing that in mind. We're looking for a 60 rack off-site off facility with the capability of commercial expansion. We have considered cloud, but there are issues around data security and on, on, ongoing costs as well, so we're still up in that one. Our partnership with our network support provider is coming to an end next year, and so we'll be looking into the next iteration of support that we need to take UHB into the 2020s. Over the next 12 months, we'll be creating the foundations for working closer with our neighboring trust, who is also of a similar size to ourselves. We'll be looking to share services and systems for the benefits of the patients, and this will be a big change both culturally and also technically. So how do we actually bring all this sort of stuff together? As a bolt-on to our My Health product uh, mentioned earlier, we're going to add virtual clinics. This will allow a patient to meet with a clinician from their own home. The secure video solution will be held as part of the electronic patient record. And as a major referral center, it's not uncommon for patients to live all over the UK. Having to travel for a short appointment can be tiresome and stressful. So we hope to improve patient care through this solution. We're also looking at how we can support junior doctors through task management and BYD, BYOD opportunities. Again, all linked to the electronic patient record. And finally, a couple of takeaways. And how we actually roll out services within healthcare at the UHB. We ensure that our foundations are in place. We have the infrastructure, the processes, and the change advisory group. We listen to our users through development and focus groups and executive boards and change boards. And we, as IT, are prepared to change in response to our business needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Has anybody got any questions? Can I ask one? Of course. When do you think we'll just have one patient record that goes across the whole UK? Oh, well, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? And it's <laughs> it secure. Yes, that's... Um, I don't know, is the answer. I would love to be able to say it's there, but I think a lot of the different parts of the hospital and the health sector actually operate in different sort of ways. 
So while a GP record will be looking at different parts of it, um, they'll be in, in certain specialisms. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the, the view that um, the Caldicott Guardians, um, Dame Fiona Caldicott is actually taken, is moving away from it is no longer a health record, it is actually a person's record, and it's the start of that. And the, the new GDPR and the new, I suppose, Caldicott 2 or 3 we're up to, is starting to give much more support for the individual to be able to say, yes, you are allowed to see my records, no, you're not allowed to see my records. So that's why GDPR is actually going to be very important for us. That's very useful, thank you. Any questions, any more? Honestly. Okay, can I say thank you to both our speakers this afternoon? They've, they've both been very good. Um, and I'm sure you can catch them at coffee break if you want to ask any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>